can we just talk about the ways that the, the, the power vacuum is filled by Stalin, how that manifests itself? Perhaps one angle we can take is how was the secret police used? How, how did power manifest itself under Stalin? Well, um, before getting to the secret police, I would just want to add the other crucial element, which is Lenin's patronage. Stalin doesn't, you know, brawl his way into the Bolshevik party and 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 dominate. Uh, he's co-opted and promoted to positions of importance by Lenin, who sees him as uh, a somewhat rough around the edges, not very sophisticated, uh, much less cosmopolitan than other Bolsheviks, but but dependable, reliable, and committed revolutionary. So. Um, I think that one of the things that's emerged, especially after archives opened up with the fall of the Soviet Union, and we were able to read more and more of the communications of Lenin, is that uh, it's there's it, it's not the case that we're talking here about um, a unconnected series of careers. Rather, there are uh, connections to be made. It's true that towards the end of his life, Lenin uh, came to be worried by uh, complaints about Stalin's rudeness towards fellow Bolsheviks. Uh, and in his testament, he warned against uh, Stalin's testimonies. Lenin fundamentally saw himself as irreplaceable. And so that doesn't really help in a succession struggle, right? Um, Stalin uh, is able to rely on a secret police apparatus that had been built up under Lenin already. And um, it's uh, very early in the foundation of the Soviet state that uh, the Cheka or the Extraordinary Commission uh, is established as a secret police to uh, terrify the enemies, beat down the opponents of the regime, and to uh, keep an eye on society more generally. Uh, the person who's chosen for that task also is an anomaly among Bolsheviks. Uh, that is a man of Polish aristocratic background, Felix Zerzhinsky who comes to be known by the nickname Iron Felix. Uh, here's a man about whom a cult of personality also is created. Uh, Dzerzhinsky is celebrated in the Soviet period as the model of someone who's harsh but fair, a, an executioner but with a heart of gold, somebody who loves children, somebody who has a tender heart but forces himself to be steely-willed against the opponents of uh, the ideological project uh, of the Bolsheviks. Um, Dzerzhinsky is succeeded by figures who will be absolutely instrumental to Stalin's exercise uh, of power, and they're not immune either. Stalin, in his purges, takes care also to purge the secret police as a way of finding others upon whom to deflect blame for uh, earlier uh, atrocities, and uh, to produce a situation where even committed Bolsheviks are uncertain of what's going to happen next uh, and feel their own position uh, to be precarious. I mean, incidentally, uh, there are other influences that probably are brought to bear here as well. It gets said about Stalin that he used to spend a lot of time flipping through Machiavelli's The Prince. And um, it seems that Stalin's personal copy of The Prince, um, nobody knows where that is, if, if, if it still exists, but um, historians have found annotations in works by Lenin that Stalin, who was a voracious reader, as it turns out, um, made in, in the back of one of the books, which sounds almost like a commentary on Machiavelli's almost but not quite suggestion that the ends justify the means. Stalin's own writing says that if someone is strong, active, and intelligent, even if they do things that other people condemn, they're still a good person. And so Stalin's self-conception of himself is someone who along these lines, and in line with Lenin's emphasis on on practical results and discipline, somebody who gets things done, that's the crucial ethical standard. And, and in ultimately, uh, in, in criticisms by later dissidents of Bolshevik morality, this question of what is the ethical standard, what is the ethical law, uh, will bring this question into focus because by the, and this goes back to Marx as well, incidentally, the notion that any ethical system, 
any notion of right or wrong is purely a product of class identity because every class produces its distinctive ideas, its distinctive religion, its distinctive art forms, its distinctive uh, styles, um, means that with no one transcendent or absolute morality, it's all up for grabs. And then it's a question of power and the exercise of power with no limits, untrammeled by any laws whatsoever. Uh, dictatorship in its purest form something that Lenin had avowed, and then Stalin comes to practice more, uh, even more fully. Not that it's possible to look deep into a person's heart, but you know, if you look at Trotsky, you could say that he probably believed deeply in Marxism and communism. Probably the same with Lenin. What do you think Stalin believed? Was he a believer? Was, was he a pragmatist that used communism as a way to gain power and ideology as part of propaganda? Or did he, in his own private moments, deeply believe in this utopia? And that's an excellent question, and, and you're quite right. I mean, we cannot peer into the inmost recesses of somebody's being and, and know for sure. My intuition, though, is that um, is that this may be a false alternative, uh, a false dichotomy. Uh, it's natural enough to to see somebody who, who does monstrous things to say, "Well, this is being ideology is being used as a cover for it." But I think that um, my suspicion is that these were actually perfectly compatible in his historical role. The notion that that there's an ideology, it gives you a a, a master plan for how history is going to develop, and your own power, the the increase of that power to unprecedented. Uh, uh, proportions, your ability to torment even your own faithful followers uh, in order just to see them squirm, which Stalin was famous for, uh, uh, to keep people unsettled. I, I, To me, it seems that for some people, those might not actually be opposed, but might even be mutually reinforcing, which is a very scary thought. It's It's terrifying, but it's really important to understand. If we look at when Stalin takes power at uh, some of the policies, so the collectivization of agriculture, why do you think that failed so uh, catastrophically, uh, especially in the 1930s with uh, Ukraine and Holodomor? I think the, the short answer is that um, the Bolsheviks in particular, but also communists more generally, have had a very conflicted relationship with agriculture. Agriculture, um, as a very, I mean, vital, obviously, but also very traditional and old form of human activity, um, has about it all of the, the smell of tradition and other problematic factors as well. Um, in a place like uh, Russia, uh, or the Russian Empire, um, peasants throughout history for centuries had wanted one thing, and that was to be left alone to farm their own land. Um, uh, the, the you know that's their utopia, and that for someone like Marx, who in, had a vision of historical development and transcendence and progress as being absolutely key. Uh, does not mesh at all with that vision. For that reason, when Marx comes up with this this tableau, this uh, tremendous display of historical transformation taking place over centuries and headed towards the final utopia, the role of farmers there is is negligible. Peasants get called um, conservative and dull as sacks of potatoes in uh, Marx's uh, historical vision because they're limited in their horizon. They farm their land, their plot, and don't have greater revolutionary goals beyond working the land and having it free and clear. Um, by contrast, industrialization, that's progress. I mean, images that today would be deeply disturbing to an environmentalist's sensibility, smokestacks, belching smoke, the byproducts of industry, a landscape transformed by uh, the factory model, that's what Marx and then later the Bolsheviks have in mind. Um, similarly, the goal, uh, even as articulated in Marx's writings, is to put agriculture and farming on a factory model so that you won't need to deal with this traditional role of the independent farmer or the peasant. Instead, you'll have people who 
benefit from progress, benefit from rationalization by working factory farms. Um, so in approaching the question of collectivization, we have to keep in mind that for uh, Stalin and his comrades who are bound and determined to drag Russia kicking and screaming into the modern age and not to allow it be beaten because of its backwardness, as Stalin puts it, traditional forms of agriculture are not what they have in mind. And in their rank of desired outcomes, industrialization, especially massive heavy industry, uh, is the sine qua non. That's their envisioned future. Uh, agriculture rates below. So in that case, the crucial significance of collectivization is to get a handle on the food situation in order to make it predictable and not to find oneself in another crisis like during the Civil War when the cities are starving, industry is robbed of labor, and the factories are at a, at a standstill. So this is really the, the, the core approach to collectivization, to put the productive capacities of the farmers uh, in a regimented way, in a state-controlled way, under the control of, of the state. This produces vast human suffering because the, for the farmers, their plot of land that they thought they had gained as a result of the revolution is now taken away. They no longer have the same incentives they had before to be successful farmers. In fact, if you're a successful farmer, and maybe have a cow as opposed to your neighbors who have no cow, you're defamed and denounced as a kulak, a tight-fisted exploiter, uh, even though you might be helping to develop uh, agriculture uh, in the region that you're from. So the result is human tragedy on a vast scale, and uh, allied to that, uh, incidentally, is uh, Stalin's sense that... Um, this is a chance to also target people who are opposed to the Bolshevik regime for other reasons, whether it's because of their Ukrainian identity, uh, whether it's because of a desire to, to for a different nationalist project. Uh, so for Stalin, there are many motives that roll into collectivization. And the final thing to be said is you are quite right that collectivization proves to be a failure because the Soviet Union never finally gets a grasp on the pro problems of agricultural production. By the end of the Soviet Union, uh, they're importing grain from the West uh, in, uh, um, uh, in spite of having some of tremendously rich farmland uh, to be found worldwide. And the reason for that had to do in part, I think, with the incentives that had been taken away. Uh, prosperous individual farmers have a motive for working their land and maximizing production. By contrast, if you are an employee of a factory-style agricultural enterprise, uh, the incentives run in very different directions. And the, the joke that was common um, for decades in the Soviet Union and other communist countries with similar systems was, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. So even labor which is um, rhetorically respected and uh, valorized, uh, in practice is rewarded with very slim rewards. And the last point, immobility. The collectivization reduces the mobility of the peasants who are not allowed because of internal passports to move to the cities unless they have permission. They're locked in place and got to say, at the time and afterwards, that looked a lot like feudalism or a neo-feudalism in terms of the restrictions on uh, on workers in the countryside. It is a terrifying, horrific, and fascinating study of how the ideal when meeting reality fails. So the the idea here is to make agriculture more efficient. To be more productive, so the industrialized model, but the implementation through collectivization had all the elements that you've mentioned that uh, contended with human nature. So first with the kulaks, so the successful farmers were punished, and so then the incentive is not just not to be a successful farmer, but to like hide added 
to that, there's a growing quota that everybody's supposed to deliver on that nobody can deliver on. And so now, because you can't deliver on that quota, you're basically exporting all your food uh, and you can't even feed yourself. And then you suffer more and more and more and there's a vicious downward spiral of like, you can't possibly produce that. Now there's an, another human incentive where you're gonna lie. Everybody lies right. on the data. That's right. And so even uh, Stalin himself probably uh, as evil or incompetent as he may be, he was not even getting good data about what's right. even happening. That's even right. if he wanted to stop the vicious downward cycle, which he certainly didn't, but he wouldn't be even able to. So there's all these like dark consequences of uh, of what on paper seems like a good ideal. And it's, it's a fascinating study of like things on paper. Yes. That's <laughs> when, right. When implemented, can go really, really bad. That's right. And and and, and the outcome here is a horrific man-made famine, not a natural disaster, not bad harvests, but a man-made famine as a result of then the compulsion that gets used by the Soviet state to extract those resources, cordoning off the area, not allowing starving, starving people to uh, to escape. Um, you put very well some of the, the implications of this case study in, in how things look in the abstract versus in practice. Um, and those phenomena were going to haunt the rest of the experience of the Soviet Union. Um, the whole notion that up and down the chain of command, everybody is falsifying or tinkering with or prettifying the statistics or their reports in order not to look bad and, and not to you know, have vengeance visited upon them, um, reaches the point where nobody, in spite of the pretense of comprehensive knowledge, right? There's a, a, a state planning agency that creates five-year plans for the economy as a whole, and which is supposed to have accurate statistics. All of this uh, is founded upon uh, a foundation of sand. That's inadvertent. That's uh, not an intended side effect. But what you described as in terms of the internal dynamics of fostering conflict in a rural society was absolutely not inadvertent. That was deliberate. The doctrine was you bring civil war. Now, had there been social tensions before? Of course there had. Had there been envies? Had there been differentiations in, uh, in, in wealth or status? Of course there had been. But a deliberate plan to bring class conflict and bring civil war and then heighten it in the countryside um, does damage. And not least of that is this phenomenon of a negative selection. Those who have most enterprise, those who are most entrepreneurial, those who have most self-discipline, those who are best organized will be winnowed again and again and again uh, sending the message that mediocrity is comparatively much safer than talent. And this pattern, incidentally, gets transposed and in tremendously harrowing ways also to an, the entire group of uh, Russian intelligentsia and intellectuals of other peoples who are in the Soviet Union. Um, they discover similarly that to be independent, to have a voice which is not compliant, uh, carries with it uh, tremendous penalties, um, um, in, in, uh, especially in Stalin's reigns of terror. Again, a difficult question about a psychology uh, of one human being, but to what degree do you think Stalin was deliberately punishing uh, the farmers and the Ukrainian farmers? And to what degree was he looking the other way and allowing the, the, the large scale incompetence, the horrific incompetence of uh, the collectivization of agriculture to happen? Well, I, mean, I think it was both things, right? I mean, there were not only sins of omission, but also sins of commission. Um, incidentally, one should add, I don't think for Stalin, it was personal. Um, these are people who are very remote from him. He never, never coming into contact with the people who are suffering in this way. Um, attributed to him uh, is the quote that uh, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. 
Um, uh, I think he, in action, certainly acted in a way that would vindicate that. Um, but the process of collectivization was not just uh, a bureaucratic snafu following on bureaucratic snafu. There was the mobilization of communist youth, of military, of party activists to go into the regions and to search for hidden food, to uh, uh, extract the uh, uh, the food where it could be found. And um, this we have testimony to this in the case of uh, people who later became dissidents, like Lev Kopolev, who wrote in his memoirs about how he was among those who were sent in to enact these policies. And he saw families with the last food being taken away, even as signs of starvation were visible already in the present. And yet he did not go mad. He didn't kill himself. He didn't fall into despair because he believed, because he had been taught and believed at least then that this was justified. This was a larger historical process and a, a greater good would result even from these enormities. So I think that uh, um, this was quite deliberate. Following this, as you've mentioned, uh, there was the process of uh, the Great Terror where the intellectuals, where the Communist Party officials, the military officers, the bureaucrats, everybody. Uh, 750,000 people were executed and over a million people were sent to the Gulag. What can you say by way of wisdom from this process of the Great Terror that Stalin implemented from 36 to 38? Well, the, the terror had... Uh, a variety of victims. Um, there were people who were true believers and who were Bolsheviks, who were especially targeted by Stalin because uh, he aimed to revenge himself for all the sort of condescension that he'd experienced in that movement before, uh, and also to eliminate rivals or potential rival uh, power centers uh, and members of their families. And then there were people who um, simply got caught up in a process whereby the repressive organs in the provinces were sent quotas. You have to achieve your quota and maybe even better yet, overachieve your quota, overperform. That would be the key to success and rising in uh, uh, the bureaucracies in the age of the terror. What's so horrifying is the way in which a whole society uh, stood paralyzed uh, in this, this process uh, and how uh, neighbors would be taken away in the middle of the night and people would be wary of talking about it. Um, resistance, uh, uh, at least in, in these urban centers, uh, was entirely paralyzed by fear when, uh, if one had somehow find a way to mobilize, somehow a way to, 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 to resist the process, the results might have been different. There's there's an astonishing book. I mean, there are so many great books that have come out quite recently, even on these topics. Orlando Figus has a amazing book called The Whisperers that traces several families' history in the Stalin period. And it's a testimony to how a whole society and some of its most intelligent people got winnowed again and again and again in that process of negative selection that we talked about, the lasting dislocation and scars that this left, and the way in which how people were not able to talk about these things in public, because that would put you next on the list, uh, suspected of, uh, of, of having less than total devotion to the state. Uh, I think one of the things that also is so terrifying about the entire process is even total devotion wasn't enough. Um, the process took on a life of its own. And I think that uh, in, it might even have surprised Stalin in some ways, um, not enough to, 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 to short circus the, the process, but the notion where um, people were invited to denounce neighbors, coworkers, maybe even family members, um, meant that ever larger groups of people would be brought into the orbit of the secret police, tortured in order to produce confessions. Those confessions then would lead to more lists of suspects of people who uh, were had to be investigated uh, and uh, um, either executed or sent to the gulags. 
um, th- the uncertainty that this produced it was enormous. Um, even loyalty was not enough to save people. The stories, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago is full of stories of dedicated co- communists uh, who find themselves in the Gulag and are sure that some mistake has been made. And uh, if only Comrade Stalin would hear about the terrible thing that has happened to them, um, surely uh, it would be corrected. And uh, um, nothing like this would have... Everyone else, by contrast, accused of terrible crimes, must there, there must be some truth behind that. So, uh, you know, talk about ways of, of disaggregating a society, ways of breaking down bonds of trust um, this left lasting traces on uh, an entire society uh, that that endure to this very day. Yeah, there again a fascinating study of human nature that there essentially was a, an emergent quota of confessions of treason. So, like, even though the whole society was terrified and were through terror loyal, there's still needed to be a lot of confessions of people right. being disloyal. Right. So you're just making shit up now. Like the, at a mass scale, stuff is being made up. And it's also the machine of the secret police starts eating itself because right. you want to be confessing on your That's right. boss, on your, and it is just this weird, dark, uh, dynamic system where human nature is just as, as it is, it's worst. Absolutely, absolutely. Why, if we look at this deep discussion we had about Marxism, uh, to what degree can we understand from that lens why th- the implementation of communism in the Soviet Union failed in such a dark way, both on the economic system with agriculture and industrialization and on the human way with the uh, just violation of every possible human right and the torture and the suffering and uh, gulags and all of all of this well i think some of it comes back to the ethical grounding that we mentioned earlier um the notion that uh, ethics are entirely situational and that any ethical system is an outgrowth of a particular class reality a particular material reality uh and that leaves the door wide open um, so I think that that, that aspect was uh, present from the very beginning. Uh, I think that the um, expectations of Marx uh, that the revolution would take hold and be successful in a developed country played a role here as well. Um, Russia, which compared to the rest of Europe, was less developed even before the First World War, is in a dire state after all of the ravage and the millions of deaths that um, continue even after the war has ended in the West, um, that leaves precious little in the way of uh, structural restraints or um, a functioning society that would say, let's not do things this way. Um, I think that in retrospect, that special role carved out for special individuals who can move this process forward and accelerate historical development um, allowed for people to step into those those roles and and appoint themselves executors of this ideological uh, vision. Um, So I think those things play a role as well. Now, it's hard to do counterfactual history, but to what degree is this basically that the communist ideals create a power vacuum and a dictator type figure steps in and then it's a roll of the dice of what that dictator is like. So can you imagine a world where the dictator uh, was Trotsky? Would we see very similar type of things? Or is the hardness and the brutality of somebody like Stalin manifested itself in um, being able to look the other way as some of these dark things were happening more so than somebody like Trotsky who would presumably be um, see the realizations of these policies and be shocked. Well, counterfactuals are hard, like yeah. you said. And uh, and one very quickly gets off into uh, really deep waters in, in speculation. There were contemporaries, and there have been scholars since, who suggest that Trotsky, by all 
indications might have been even more radical than Stalin in the tempo that he wanted to achieve. Oh uh, think of think of the the uh, the um, the slogan of permanent revolution. Trotsky also, um, who dabbled in in so many uh, things in his, his intellectual life, also spoke in almost utopian terms that are just astonishing to read. In utopian terms about the construction of the new man and the new woman. And that out of the raw material of humanity, once you really get going and once you've established uh, a system that matches your hopes for the future, it'll be possible to reconfigure people. And I like talk about ambition to create essentially the next stage in human evolution, a, a new species growing out of humanity. Um, those don't sound like very modest or limited approaches. Um, and uh, I guess we just really won't know.